Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's, to today's webcast, Back Off POS Malware, How to Know If You're Infected. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator here at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of this webcast. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First of all, please make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio por portion will stream through your PC and laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume. The volume setting in Windows is typically um, it, it is going through your headset and make sure it's turned on and the volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is being presented using a slide deck and you can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge it. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try hitting the refresh icon in your browser URL bar or hitting F5 to refresh. If at all, uh, if any technical difficulties come up, please click on the Q&A widget and that has a question mark icon and it covers common technical issues. If you have a question for one of our speakers, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. So we'll be holding the questions until the end of our, uh, so we have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Also, we'll be doing a couple of surveys during the webcast, and so uh, we'd really like your feedback on that, so please be on the lookout for those. And lastly, I'll be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and a link to the slides. So now let's get on with the presentation. We have three speakers today, Ken Weston, Edward Smith, and Katherine Brocklehurst. Ken Weston is a security researcher at Tripwire whose technology exploits and endeavors have been fe featured in Forbes, Good Morning America, Dateline, New York Times, The Economist, and most re recently Ken was seen on Bloomberg TV discussing the recent J.P. Morgan breach. He has won awards from MIT, CTIA, Oregon Technology Awards, uh, entrepreneur and named in Portland Business Journal's 2013 40 Under 40. Next we have Edward Smith. He's been implementing supporting and marketing technology products for over 15 years and is currently Product Marketing Manager for Vulnerability Management Solutions at Tripwire. Edward has held various positions as a Systems Engineer, Sales Engineer, Support Manager, and Technical Trainer for companies like Dell, Adobe, and Gateway. And finally, we have Katherine Brocklehurst. She's been involved in product management and product marketing in network security for more than 15 years, working with network security technologies ranging from protocols to core encryption to intrusion detection prevention to XML firewalls for web apps. She's touched every layer in the ISO model and now focusing on helping enterprises secure and harden their system configurations to combat, combat escalating threats in our highly connected world. Catherine works on this every day as Senior Product Marketing Manager at Tripwire. Welcome to all three of you. And so now, without further delay, I will hand it over to Catherine Brocklehurst. Take it away, Catherine. Well, thanks, Kate. And uh, wow, we've been well introduced, so uh, I'll just jump right in here. Thanks, everybody, for joining. We have a really simple agenda. We'll be calibrating our talk to cover a spectrum for those of you that are attending because we do have customers, uh, Tripwire customers that are familiar with the security realm as well as business leaders and consumers and other non-technical folks who might be familiar. Um, we'll have some time at the end for uh, Q&A. So what I'd like to do is uh, first just highlight, the, you all have been hearing about it, there are security alerts going on inside the security industry and a lot is going on around back off and other variants of point of sale malware and Ken will cover that in detail. Advisories and alerts are coming from lots of organizations but we're especially noting that the US CERT organization, the PCI, uh, DSS and S SSC organization have issued a bulletin, and also um, the uh, Secret Service have all come out. Retailers are uh, in high alert particularly because they're checking to see if they might have been infected with back off. However, you don't have to be a brick and mortar style or uh, even online realtor, uh, 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 retailer. You could be a hospital um, accepting credit cards in the cafeteria and in the um, drug dispensary pharmacy, you could be a, a government agency, perhaps think DMV. There are all kinds of agencies and organizations that can be affected by this malware. So 
Uh, what we'd like to just sh share for all of you that may not know it, the U.S. CERT is available at this URL, and uh, it was initially issued on July 31st. It's been revised a number of times because there's an ongoing investigation, and it's so important that I've listed it twice, you might notice. And uh, we are uh, seeing that this type of malware, this particular variant, has gone back all the way to October of 2013. It's, the reason it's called back off, in case you were wondering, is that uh, they've, the, a lot of the forensic investigators investigation has come up with seeing this word inside the code, and they just dubbed it back off. So, of course, there's another kind of alert that we're all seeing and hearing about every day, and uh, any business that conducts credit card transaction is at risk, uh, as I mentioned. In the case of many of these retailers, their public disclosures have followed a fairly similar storyline. I think it's almost that I hate, would hate to think that the public is becoming jaded, you know, and uh, just beginning to expect breaches every day, but um, uh, Home Depot stock wouldn't indicate that that's the case. However, a public disclosure is usually the first announcement, and then they normally are not told uh, or are told from an outside source, so the law enforcement or uh, fraud analysts will contact them and let them know, and then, uh, bummer, it's usually been determined it was worse than first thought after after a few more days or even a week or so of investigation. And um, also, and in many cases, they had been breached for months before discovery. And this goes along with um, all sorts of reports in the industry that those of you in security know. Most of these public breaches are uh, being linked to similar strains of point of sale malware, uh, such as back off. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over now to our, our security researcher, Ken Weston. Oh, thank you, Catherine. All right, so, um, so before any of the malware um, can get to these point-of-sale devices, the attackers, they have to get into the network first. Uh, and this is no easy task, as most retailers have spent at least some effort to protect their networks from intrusion, or at the very least ensure they comply with the minimum requirements for PCI DSS. So, you know, Lockheed Martin, they have a cyber kill chain, and it's a well-known model of the attack lifecycle, um, and it applies to the attack patterns we've seen with these mega retail breaches so far. So the, um, the attacks against uh, retail giants are not a crime of convenience, nor are they implemented over a short span of time. These attacks are meticulously planned, and the groups responsible have done their homework in, re in the recon phase of the cyber kill chain. They gather a great deal of intelligence on the target, they learn about their corporate structure and employees, they map out organizations' IT infrastructure, such as IP ranges, ports, and running services. In addition, they identify vendors, uh, service, uh, vendor service providers and trusted business partners who may provide a less direct path into the target network. So one successful attack vector by these groups has been um, the targeting of remote desktop applications. We've seen a number of retailers compromise simply through the brute forcing of passwords or gaining login credentials through spear phishing campaigns or other social engineering tactics. Target was compromised through a combination of a phishing attack that hit a trusted business partner, um, and then from there they were able to uh, access Target's network using their login credentials. Then, of course, we have good old exploits targeting unpatched applications and systems. Once attackers gain a foothold into the network, things get easier. Things are generally less locked down, and the attackers will target what are classified as critical assets of the network, such as Active Directory and network applications, that will then work to escalate their privileges. In a number of uh, retail breaches, uh, a target has been um, the patch servers, which feed out to updates to point-of-sale devices. By compromising these systems, they can easily deploy malware to the point-of-sale devices. However, this is not necessary as they can also go direct to the point of sale systems themselves. So once the malware is installed, uh, credit card data is harvested through various methods, which we will discuss here in a bit. Um, the credit card data can be collected on the point of sale device themselves or moved and aggregated to another compromised server. The next and final phase is the exfiltration process. So this is a rather delicate process that the attackers will take extra special care to avoid detection. At this stage, the retailer will usually only be made aware of the breach when the Secret Service contacts them after bank fraud analysts start detecting the stolen cards being sold in underground markets. So you know, to defend the, against these sophisticated uh, criminal syndicates targeting retail organizations, it requires a defense in-depth strategy. No single security control or tool will serve to block this highly organized and well-resourced um, adversary. 
the first step organizations should do is in preventative measure is to focus on system hardening, identifying vulnerabilities in the perimeter where an attacker can gain a foothold into the network, identifying configuration and application vulnerabilities that an attacker can leverage, and not just on their own network, but also through their trusted business partners who may also have access to that network. Continuous network security monitoring is critical to protecting your internal network as we can, uh, we can no longer depend solely on preventative measures to mitigate today's cyber adversary. Identifying internal vulnerabilities, particularly for critical assets, is crucial. Any changes or security events need to be logged and monitored just, um, just, just as importantly. These events require rich context to identify true indicators of compromise to be able to sig uh, signal out the noise. So now we're going to zoom in a bit and discuss the actual point-of-cell malware itself. There are several families of uh, point-of-cell malware that have been used over the last few years. Um, here's just a few of them. Um, I'll be discussing general characteristics, characteristics and features that are shared by most of these tools, and later we'll discuss specific indicators of back-off. So PCI DSS provides some guidance around how credit card data should be stored. However, it only covers pieces of the data security puzzle when it comes to the collection and storage of credit card data. The primary focus of PCI DSS is data at rest and after authorization, where it is mandated that credit card data must be encrypted if stored, and if not stored, must be wiped from systems after authorization. Hackers are well aware of these requirements and as such have adapted their tools and tactics to avoid to get a hold of credit card data where it's not encrypted. There are several places that credit card data may exist unencrypted that can easily be harvested by increasingly sneaky malware. So a few key places that point-of-sale malware will look for unencrypted data on a point-of-sale device and server infrastructure are on the hard drives, of course, um, of the devices, uh, um, as well as in network and in the memory. So here's an example of a packet capture where we can easily sniff credit card information on the network. Many retailers fail to implement point-to-point -point encryption, and often credit card data is passed as plain text across the network, making it very easy for any malicious app or user to grab that information. So RAM scraping is a uh, method uh, where malware is installed on the point-of-sale systems, and able, it's able to grab credit card data out of memory. Uh, this is before the information gets encrypted and stored on any drives or transmitted across the network. This approach to credit card data collection has been used in some of the major breaches we've seen, such as at Target, Neiman Marcus, and P.F. Chang's, and of course, most recently, Home Depot. And it's really, it's really successful uh, for these attackers because it's very difficult to block and it's uh, very easy to evade detection. When credit card data is found, it's usually logged to a file on the point of sale uh, system or transmitted to another, another system before being exfiltrated to the organization. <clears throat> so, uh, one kind of neat thing we actually worked on here at Tripwire was testing with Tripwire Enterprise was the ability to detect when a new file is created and to automatically check to see if there are any credit card numbers in that file. This quick test can um, help identify the presence of point-of-sale malware, regardless of its collection mechanism. When we see files being created on a point-of-sale device or anywhere on the network, we'll want to alert this uh, for immediate investigation. Detecting uh, one credit card number could be the difference between a thwarted data breach attempt story that you tell your buddies at the bar and becoming the next Target or Home Depot. With that, I'm going to hand this off to Catherine, who will be going into some more specific indicators regarding the back-off variant of point-of-sale malware. Thank you, Ken. And um, we're actually going to take a few moments here for a survey. It's very brief. Um, I would like you to select one of these answers that might apply to you, and we will uh, just take a few moments to do that. If you don't mind, it would be a useful point of note, I think all of us would find it interesting to know how quickly you think your organization could uh, detect a breach on critical systems. Here at Tripwire, we've been researching this particular question at all sorts of uh, venues and with all sorts of professionals, and um, so I'm hopeful that all of you are taking a moment to select and vote. And so let's take a look. Um, okay, previewing, let's see, okay, we have a few of you answering, uh, let's give it just a few more minutes, 
uh, everyone. We're, I don't know if you can see what I'm seeing, because uh, I just am not sure if you can. But uh, all right, so let me just share some of what's been shown so far. Keep voting, those of you that haven't. We have uh, over 200 of you online. So we would like to, uh, we would like to get uh, just a few more, if you don't mind. Here's what we've seen so far. And uh, that's kind of cool. Please, um, if you haven't, just do a quick vote and wrap it up. And uh, then I'll just move on. Thanks, everybody. Let me just make sure there's no fresh. All right, here we are. So um, now, uh, you know, Ken had just showed you a very cool little uh, capability that we worked on making sure was available to our customers so that if one of the most common things that's done with point of sale is that a little file is created either on the system if there's room or that they choose to do it either sometimes in RAM or on the hard drive or elsewhere within your infrastructure. And we've seen this kind of work done in a number of these attacks. But in, in, uh, in this screen, what I'm showing is um, the content that we've created for our customers uh, has the ability to detect of course, our, our file integrity monitoring does detect when any new file is created, and we do that in real time. So we can see automatically if things are changing. Um, and in this case, when uh, we are, uh, let me just show you there. So take a look at what's being circled. This is actually two screens squinched together, but what we've got is a failure, a test failure, because what we were looking for is whether or not the, the uh, file um, the file data structure was clean, and it failed. It was not clean. It has local dot dat there. So if you look at the bottom, what circled shows you uh, the local dot dat is common is a common name that's being used by the point of sale malware guys to load up credit cards, and they may be doing it more APT style, one by one, and kind of you know shuttling that out, exfiltrating slowly. Uh, tough to catch, truly, or they may be. Um, building up a bigger file and sending it off to Russia. So what you would want to do is in any case, and what we've allowed our customers is a, the way to catch um, a number of the files that have been indicated. It could be local.dat, it might be a log.txt where if your variant has the key logger installed, so sometimes the name of that file is, lo is log.txt, and so the keystrokes will be captured. In addition, point of sale malware uh, uh, terminals uh, often have to be logged into, and they can catch those as well. So um, it, it's important to look for the things that we know are there. We get this information from the US CERT alert, and at the end, if you'd like to have that information, we will be making it available. Uh, it's very, you know, it's hashes and a lot of file names and things that you can look for and you'll want to do. Also, placements of those files into different paths. So one last point of note is that our solution, if you were to find that uh, you have already got these indicators in place and you are breached, um, we can also take systems that have a known good baseline and roll that back to a known good configuration. And that's one of the showcase uh, features that we offer. It, that process can also be automated. So. Um, these are, uh, this slide is just a few of the common attack vectors, and if you've got any of these where Windows is on your point of sale systems, uh, Windows based, um, it's typical the antivirus in the earliest times, especially in August, they were not catching. Also firewalls, uh, both of these mechanisms, if you were doing defense in depth, which was good practice, you will find those were bypassed. Also, remote desktop applications were um, pinpointed as one of the key uh, attack vectors, and there's a list of those that um, we've got later that you can see. Uh, and they, it, you know, it goes to Windows desktop application, or remote desktop, and Apple remote desktop, and log me in, and uh, a number of them. So those are all listed as well in the cert. And then once um, they're taking the earlier approach, as Ken noted, this is common to brute force passwords, right? But you can uh, set up for uh, too many password attempts and locking out the user, right? So there are things that can be done there. And then in, uh, all, throughout the uh, indicators of, a, of compromise, there are changes in the install path, hashes, registry keys, and uh, other static file names that are used and that you can um, search for. We also offer some hardening guidance um, on uh, 
remote desktop access, network security, and cash register and point of security at the end as well. So um, here's a, a kind of a busy slide. We also sort of just covered some of this, so there are some what to do suggestions here. Uh, a lot of this could be made available later if you want some of the download slides that will uh, or download files will offer. But I, I wanted to point out especially that continuous fi integrity file monitoring. Um, Sorry, file integrity monitoring is one of the only ways to detect in real time that new files are being created. And once they've reached the point of sale, and they may have used this along the way to get there, but uh, once they've reached the point of sale, they have to begin doing this. And you will find there are, at least in this variant, you'll find that these files exist, and we can help you with that. Also, if you take a look on the bottom three or four of these on the left, the IOCs noted, there's a couple of things that I just pulled out of the uh, US CERT alert because I think they're interesting to actually have the names of files that are being added, at least as of the time these reports were issued, these alerts were issued, right? These are morphing all the time. They're changing things. They're um, moving along path that will be always something that we have to keep up with. All right, so um, there's a number of items here and you can take a look at. And then before I uh, turn it over to Ed, which I'm about to do, we have one last survey. So um, I'd like to go to that right now. In this survey, you may select any that apply. And please take just a moment to do that and we're, and we're going to be getting ready to wrap up fairly soon. So uh, this is the top challenge that you face in detecting breaches on critical systems and doing so quickly. Please check all that apply. Now I'll take a look and see how we're all going here. Wow, thank you guys. You're replying rapidly. Wonderful. Keep going. We've got uh, we've got a few more to come in. Um, all right. Keep going. Okay. So let's let's let you all see what we what we see here. Um, I'm going to push this out to all of you. Here we go. A lot of data. Too many alerts and false positives. It's one of the largest complaints about agents and uh, file integrity monitoring. And one of the things I'd like to point out is that we've built in some really good heuristics to draw down to the most relevant issues for your organization and only the events of interest that might need to be attended to quickly. And we don't swath you with every little thing out there. Uh, we do a, a, we have a special feature, Change IQ, that can distill down to just the key points that matter. All right, and one last look at this preview. Yay, thanks those of you who have applied. Let's go on. So I'm turning over now to Ed, who's going to talk a, not just about what these, these uh, uh, alerts are, but what you can do about them. Thank you, Catherine. So now that we've talked about the attack process and indicators of compromise, let's talk about what you should do about it. The US CERT advisory includes a solutions section with detailed guidance on addressing the backoff family of malware. And CERT points out that at the time of the publication, backoff was widely undetected by antivirus vendors. The large gap of time between when a POS malware is released into the wild and when antivirus vendors are able to detect that malware, that gap leaves organizations exposed and at risk. Because of this gap, a defense in depth approach to minimize the, pos to minimize the possibility of an attack and mitigate the, ri the risk of data compromise is essential. And Tripwire has identified six key solution areas that address each solution area in the US CERT advisory. Change control, manage and enforce policies, vulnerability and risk management, system hardening, log and event management, and incident detection and forensics. So in the next few slides, we'll, we'll take you through each of these areas and talk about how these controls can help you address threats like back off and other malware malware uh, variants that are affecting POS devices. And with that, I'll actually hand it right back over to you, Catherine, to address the change control. 
Okay, and I'm excited to do this one, everybody, so I hope you're not asleep already. Please pay attention because, honestly, if you take a look at everything that's been explained so far, unless you have the ability to catch files and changes that are occurring in your environment all the way from outside at the perimeter through to the point of sale itself because it's not just a, hi, I'm on your point of sale, right? They make their way all along. And so it, if you can't check uh, and and verify that not some new things are happening on your systems, it, it's going to be a problem. And you'll find that file integrity monitoring has been recommended by, you know, pretty much everyone, whether it's the PCI organization or US CERT. In the, in the CERT alert, it's, not, it's noted that as one of the key factors for um, catching the IOCs. Um, and in our case, we'd just like to highlight you should you get a trusted baseline once you have it in place, and you can then you can do what the CERT says to do, which is perform a binary or checksum comparison. Um, and then, of course, improving your policies. If you take a look at your passwords, defaults, and et cetera, all that can be uh, known the status of within. Uh, you can you, you can push those changes out if you decide to ruggedize or bump up your security. You can push it out at once, and uh, and then watch also for these specific content uh, items from back off. Uh, you can use custom rules to, to check for some of these things uh, and, and so forth. And then another point to note is that you're going to want to have your system hardened as this, you know, FIM will help you do that because it shows you what you have in place. You can at least take a poll of what's on your systems today, as Ed discussed, your ports, your services, your things that are in place, and have these been approved. Our, you know how things drift. So you you, you got to try and buff up your, your system uh, configurations and improve your policies. And I would add, enforce security through with your partners. I don't know if any of you saw the U.S. government um, announcement today, uh, the security industry folks probably have, that the, uh, the feds pretty much don't have a list of their vendors. Whoa. So I, you know, you will find that in, in on, online, and I, I just think that it's important that every company bring this type of rigor in where you're going to ask your partners to uh, step up and be as secure as you need them to be. And then this, this just summarizes a, a whole array of good practices around managing and enforcing policies. The number one thing we hear is that people, well, oh, I can establish a policy, I can't enforce it. Well, you could at least know when it's being deviated, right? When someone is drifting or changes are occurring such that you could take action or at least begin to uh, have the discussion across the organization. In this case as well, some of the lists here are uh, items, that, and most of this comes from the CERT, is, and I like this one, if you have a software and a hardware firewall, when it's recommended you have both uh, types in your organization, that you may want to take a look at your ports, maybe use some non-standard ports, and also uh, there are some tunneling techniques that you can possibly offer if you're going to give remote desktop access. And with that, Ed's going to talk a little bit about vulnerability. Vulnerability and risk assessment helps organizations detect, respond, and protect point-of-sale environments from threats like back-off. And vulnerability and risk assess assessment solutions do that by identifying unpatched vulnerabilities that provide opportunities for attackers to gather information about your networks, information about vulnerabilities that provide an initial attack vendor vector into your organization, and vulnerabilities on critical assets that can be exploited to propagate malware across your network. Vulnerability and risk assessment also provides visibility of network devices, services, and applications, including remote desktop applications. So looking back at the, the poll results from our poll question, 54% of you were interested in having greater visibility over your, over your network, and that's something that a, vulnerability and risk assessment solution can help with. When looking at advanced vulnerability management solutions, these types of controls can go beyond just simple vulnerability detection and asset, asset inventory and actually provide additional capabilities that help protect your organization in each stage of a POS malware attack. And these types of capabilities can include highlighting vulnerabilities that may be exposing sensitive information about your organization on public networks, or highlighting vulnerabilities that could be leveraged in a phishing attack to provide privileged access on an end user's desktop. Advanced vulnerability management solutions can also do things like 
detect default administrative passwords that could be used by an attacker. If it's an easily guessable password, that's a way into your network or a way to advance the attack. Vulnerabilities in web applications, intranet sites. These types of services can be vulnerable to SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and other exploits that, again, provide an initial attack vector or a means of advancing the attack. Vulnerability management and, and risk management solutions can also help secure your business partners. As, as Catherine mentioned earlier, your business partners could potentially be an attack vector into your network. And with an enterprise vulnerability management solution, these types of controls uh, can, can allow business partners to work together to share vulnerability and risk intelligence to ensure that both companies are communicating securely. Real-time analytics. Again, going back to the poll results, 55% of you wanted the ability to very quickly um, access information. It, and this information is, is what's necessary to enable fast response. And that's done by being able to quickly find specific applications, like those remote desktop applications, specific types of operating systems that are affected by malware. In this case, we're looking at Windows operating systems. And, and other information about device profiles, about the devices that are on your network. So with a real-time analytics solution, it just takes a few keystrokes, and you get in real time a view of the remote services on your network, what ports they're using, you know, we're looking at are these a standard remote access port or, or not. And then also business context. You know, when, when we find these vulnerable machines, who, who owns this machine? Where is it located? Who, who can I ask for help in, in patching and remediating this? And then last, uh, but, but certainly not least, advanced vulnerability management solutions help prioritize response by showing you the most critical risk. And I think this also ties back to the, the poll results of, you know, the, the number one problem that we saw in the results was too many alerts, too many false positives, too much noise, not enough actionable information. An enterprise management uh, vulnerability management solution can, can help you filter out some of that noise. And that's done by going beyond a basic or standard high, medium, and low score or a 1 to 10 risk score with something that's more granular and that can be used and filtered based on business and risk context so that you make the best use of limited resources by fo focusing on what's most important. And with that, I'll hand the presentation back over to Ken Weston. Thanks, Ed. So uh, login event management, um, you know, I, th I think the best way to say this is you can't catch what you can't see. Uh, collecting data and having automation tools in place to correlate and identify events that matter is an art and a science. It requires great security teams, policies, and procedures, as well as proper tools to scan for mountains of data generated by your environment. Log collection isn't just a requirement for PCI DSS. It's also a key resource to your defense in-depth strategy. So along those lines, uh, when it comes to uh, your, your incident detection and forensics capability, you know, in addition to log and event data being the source for real-time alerts, that data is also serves as a core resource to identify historical patterns and anomalies in your environment. It is rare that one indicator of compromise is a lone incident. It is often tied to multiple indicators and is critical to, to identify um, the attack patterns, not just single indicators. So with that, um, we, uh, we do have some resources that are available to us to you. Um, we have so many that uh, we're actually going to send out a follow-up email. Um, and one great one that we have is um, Hacking Point of Sale. Uh, we actually had a webcast with Slava Gomzin, who is the author, um, a really good guy, uh, know, really knows his stuff. Uh, we do have the free sample chapter that outlines some um, of the uh, payment architecture, um, as well as key vulnerabilities within the system that are just inherent in um, payment applications. Uh, we'll also have several of the advisories and some other resources available to you. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ed, and uh, we're going to open this up for the Q&A. Okay, so if anyone has any questions about today's presentation or the topics or any questions for our speakers, please locate the Q&A button on your screen. Go ahead and enter in uh, any questions that you have, and we will begin the Q&A process.
Okay, and we'll start with the we'll start with the first question here. Uh, so we have a question: Is this part of FIM solution only? Can anything be detected with with the IP360? So what we've shown in this presentation today has been a variety of, of tripwire solutions that are working together to address the different pieces of the back off malware, for, all the way from the uh, re recon all the way through the you know exfiltration of the data. Uh, so we're not just looking at, at the FIM solution. We're also looking at vulnerability management, uh, system hardening, really all the uh, the previous slides that we were looking at, and we'll pass the mic here to, to Catherine who can also address that question. Yeah, I'm taking over on this one because I also want to do the next one. So um, in, in the question is if uh, was also, is this part of the FIB solution only? And I'm guessing that something piqued your interest in the course of the presentation and wondering, um, I will just clarify that the FIM content that we have available for our customers is the, is the sort that will allow people to go out, look for the specifics that are in the alert, uh, hash, um, you know, known hashes, uh, known directory locations where files are placed, uh, and or not known where we're just searching for a, a static file name that's known because of the research that's been done already. So um, that is part of the file integrity and uh, the I, I think Ed also mentioned that a lot of these, all, of, all three of our big solutions, vulnerability, log, and event management, as well as FIM and uh, policy management, all kind of work inter, inter, well, interwoven. Um, they, they're, uh, so I wanted to answer the next one that um, really I, could, I felt, let me find it here. Um, it was uh, related to, Oh, encryption. Yeah, I wanted to highlight a couple things. Um, there was a question, would uh, um, two-factor auth be a good way to combat remote desktop compromise, which isn't encryption, I'll add. Uh, yes, that is one way. Another way that was offered is a suggestion that you might want to use um, any number of, say, uh, strong SSL, SSH, um, and other types of maybe tunnel. Uh, the access on the remote desktop application. That's one thing. And, and back to encryption, if uh, we had an encrypted, a set of encrypted files or if the attacker was placing encrypted data because they were going to pull it off later and decrypt it, um, or they would hope to, would we be able to uh, detect that? And what we can do is detect that encryption is in place in the file. We cannot decrypt that file, but we could tell that there is a file. It may match the file name that we know of today, you know, but these things morph. And inside we would know that the data was encrypted, but we cannot see uh, credit card or detailed information. Um, back to Ken's suggestion that, you know, encrypting will give a higher barrier to those attackers. So I'm going to hand back now for Ken. Yeah, sure. so, uh, yeah, go ahead, Ken. Uh, so uh, I have a question here. Is two-factor authentication a good way to combat remote desktop compromise? Um, you know, that, that may be one method, but, um, you know, what I would actually do is uh, put that behind a VPN. Um, that allows the administrator to have a little more tighter control over who has access, um, you know, to the, the device at all to even uh, run scans. Uh, you implement that. Um, also, um, enabling logging so that if you do see and detect uh, multiple failed logins, um, that you, you either lock that system down or block that account or block the IP, um, you know, a few different methods uh, for that. So um, it's a really good question. Um, you know, I think it's something that a lot of retailers need to realize is um, they, they may have um, some of these open ports um, that are available, and that is a, a prime attack vector. All right, so we'll move on to uh, the next question here. Uh, do you have free evals for file integrity? Uh, definitely head over to tripwire.com and you can request a demo and evaluation. And moving on to uh, next question. Oh, we did, we did have somebody asking, can we get a copy of the slides? Uh, we will be including a link to the deck in the follow-up email that we sent out, so absolutely just look for that in your email. 
Great. So I have a couple more questions here. So um, one is, if the credit card number was encrypted by the malware on a file in the point-of-sale system, would your part be able to detect that or you know, any FIM solution? Um, so you, know, you don't necessarily have to be able to detect that the credit card number is there. You would still um, be able to identify that the file was created, um, and that's something that should file an alert. Uh, we're finding is that the majority of these um, uh, malware will actually try to hide um, those files inside of a Windows um, system directory. Um, so anything that gets created, you want to pay attention to that. If you start seeing um, encrypted data get written to that, um, you want to go ahead and identify the process um, that, uh, that actually you know, is writing those files. Um, and then another question here was, are, are landline-based credit card terminals at risk? So it, does, it doesn't really matter if it's a landline or not. If you're not encrypting that information between the, the terminal and the payment processor, um, that information can be intercepted. So um, you know, it doesn't matter you know, what vehicle you're actually transmitting that data across. If the, if the information is not encrypted, um, an attacker or your adversary will be able to harvest that information. Great. You guys want to answer some more? Yeah, um, there was a question if the, uh, T, if the Tripwire content would be made available for Tripwire customers to download, and yes, uh, it will be on TCC, and you can log in and uh, pull that down. We'll send you a link for that in follow-up, those of you that are customers, and you will be able to get rules, uh, some policies, some tests that we've got, and content that will help you out. And it, you're right, it isn't up on the, on the uh, TCC site yet, but it will be shortly, and we'll send that link out. Thanks. Got a lot of great questions coming in. I'll, I'll go ahead and take this next one. Uh, will the vulnerability scanner tool detect if systems are affected by back off? Uh, so I can speak you know, to Tripwire's vulnerability management solutions. Uh, they are vulnerability management solutions. They, they are not malware, anti-malware, antivirus solutions. Um, however, with a uh, notable uh, malware, malware like Backoff, we have added coverage for those indicators of compromise. So again, this is not malware detection, but we've brought that detection capability uh, into our solutions to provide that threat context to add a, um, a, another way of, of sorting through and, and parsing through that data. Right? You know, so going back to you know, the false positives, false alarms, ha having that ability to detect those indicators of compromise, again, helps prioritize, filter uh, that information to, to make it actionable. So we have our Tripwire research team, our, our vulnerabilities and exposures research team. Uh, they, you know, quickly worked, uh, you know, when this, when this notice came out to provide detection rules for those indicators of compromise. But, but typically at, at Tripwire, we do almost never cover malware in, in our products. But it, in this case, it was an exception. Um, it was a way that we could provide additional risk context to our customers. Um, so in this case, you, you can use uh, IP360, uh, Pure Cloud, or, or even our, our free secure scan service to look for those indicators of compromise that, that would indicate potential uh, infection by back off. All right, and we'll move on to the next question. Uh, would Emmet scramble RAM addresses enough to mitigate the threat? Ken, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I would not rely uh, solely on something like Emet to to be a security control. Um, we're finding that, uh, you know, even with Emet, I think a patch was just released today that from Microsoft that um, covered a vulnerability within Emet itself. So, um, y you know, it may help, but I would not rely on it. Again, I would um, I would make sure that you have deployed multiple um, security controls to protect that information. Um, so, and then it was another question kind of along those lines. It's, it was a follow-up to the encrypted data file. He was asking if um, I'm actually seeing malware do this, uh, basically encrypt the collected data. Um, I've, I've heard about it, um, a particular sophisticated version of malware that has done it. One thing to remember is that uh, Black POS, for example, is basically open source. Um, the source code was released in the underground. Um, so that's how the Home Depot version, um, they were able to modify that so that it actually masquerades as an antivirus application. Um, they also deployed some more sophisticated methods for scraping um, credit card information. So it wouldn't be difficult to, you know, of the imagination to assume that it, um, you know, encrypting that file is, you know, is, uh, isn't on the horizon. Yeah. 
here I am talking along muted. I apologize to all of you. So you might have even heard me mumbling in the far away one. So um, I'd like to answer the question is, uh, are there any Tripwire customers buying Tripwire's FIM license for their point of sale systems? And in fact, yes, there are. And, if, and we've created a specific part number that's strictly for that because it is a popular um, use of the, of the product. So if you have an interest in that, I'm sure you can get some help finding out about, uh, about it. But yes, we do have. Thank you. All right. So I, I see another question for Ken in the list here. Is there any physical evidence on the card readers themselves, or is it all in the software? Uh, most of the indicators, are gonna, I think, are going to be file-based. Um, I'm not quite sure what you know, physical access, um, um, but uh, you know, most of those are going to be um, files. There might be information that's in RAM. I think the, the data that's in RAM is particularly dangerous because it's so difficult to detect. Um, there have been cases where the information will be held in RAM for a long period of time, um, and then you know, batch extracted to a file uh, rather quickly. Um, so it's really difficult to go in and identify that. Um, you know, um, to get the information that's already been exfiltrated uh, by the time you actually get to the device. Um, so hope that answered the question. All right, going to the next question. How, how do you scan POS devices for vulnerabilities? And I can go ahead and, and answer this one. Um, when looking at a vulnerability scan, uh, you have kind of a, a basic scan, which is more of an external, uh, uh, or I should say remote scan. So this is a case where a vulnerability assessment tool is, is looking at what uh, ports, what services are exposed to the network. Uh, you know, is it running a web server? Is that web server vulnerable? That, that type of thing. Um, that's kind of a, a basic scan. From a more in-depth, uh, in advanced perspective, uh, vulnerability scanners can actually scan deep into the machine, and, and what I mean by that is a credentialed scan. So in this case, we provide administrative credentials or domain credentials to the vulnerability assessment tool, and then when the vulnerability assessment tool performs its scan, it actually logs into the machine and, and takes a look around. And, and what that allows us is to look at things like the file system, uh, configuration files, and the, the registry. Uh, so this isn't an agent on the machine. This is remotely looking at the local contents of the, of the hard drive and, and the configuration of the machine. And, and this can be especially important looking at something like malware, like backoff. So for those indicators of compromise, you're not really going to see that exposed to the network. Um, you would want to provide those credentials so that you can look at what uh, for those indicators of compromise, those, those Java and Adobe Flash folders, those, those registry keys, providing those credentials is the best way um, to scan those POS devices um, for vulnerabilities, uh, to get a good list of software and, and devices on the machine, and then also, you know, again, th those indicators of a compromise for back off. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. I think, sure. Ken, you had one picked out. Uh, yeah, so the uh, question is, uh, will PCI 3.0 compliance protect us from back off? No. Um, basically, uh, you know, PCI compliance, you know, it's, it's making, it, it's, it's made some progress. Um, you know, one thing I really do like about PCI compliance is that the, the uh, NetFlow uh, diagrams where it actually requires organizations to make a map of their, um, their systems and their infrastructure and actually f uh, follow the flow of uh, payment information, um, you know, actually visualizing, you know, where that information is and where it can be compromised. Um, I think that's good. Uh, but in terms of, you know, following all PCI compliance, will that guarantee that that I'm secure. Um, no, I won't. Um, especially things like RAM scraping, you know, those aren't addressed. Um, you know, there are um, places where the credit card numbers are not encrypted, um, and then that still isn't addressed. Um, so we still have a long ways to go. Okay, let's go back to the list of questions. A lot, a lot of great questions coming in today. Okay, so let's see. Okay, here we go. The uh, 
Or if, so I've got a question, if, if organizations aren't detecting these breaches, how do they know that they've been breached? Right, so a lot of times you hear about um, Secret Service actually uh, being the ones that notify them. What happens is, is that these credit cards, they get sold in underground markets, um, and then um, carters will actually purchase those, and then they'll actually be the ones that commit the fraud. Um, and fraud analysts at banks and other organizations, there's um, even a company called RippleShot um, that does a great job of this. Um, they're able to identify specifically where those um, cards came from. Um, they can identify patterns of purchases, um, and then that's when the Secret Service usually contacts that particular retailer. Um, so basically by then, it's way too late for the, the retailer um, you know, to, to stop the breach. It's already happened. You know, at that point, um, you know, expect them to be on Krebs on security. Um, they're going to be featured in the Wall Street Journal as you know, joining the uh, Mega Retail Breach Club. Um, and uh, there's, it's really interesting how all that works. Um, but um, you know, once that actually occurs, um, it's, uh, it's kind of the point of no return for the data breach. Okay, thank you, Ken. So we'll move on to the next question. Is RAM scraping the same as screen scraping? And I, I was going to address it, but it looks like Ken is, is eager to, so I'll let, uh, let him take it. Uh, no, so RAM scraping is actually, um, we actually have a, a demo we're working on here too. I'll uh, have a video here uh, hopefully in the next week that actually demonstrates how RAM scraping works. Um, but basically, it, it actually looks at processes that are in um, the system that are running in memory, um, and it actually pulls it directly out, out of the RAM. Um, so it pulls all that bits and it has um, regular expressions or other methods um, to actually pull what looks like credit card numbers and then loads that into a file. You know, screen scraping, it's, uh, it's more about like, you know, using a scraper to grab content off of a website or something like that. So, or, you know, grabbing screenshots and things like that. Um, you know, you can probably grab information, um, you know, similarly, um, but it's a lot sneakier to do it at a RAM and you can do it um, at a massive scale. All right, so we'll move on. We got some, a little bit of time left. We'll move on to the next question. It, is there a solution available for terminals that do not use typical operating systems? And then they go on to say uh, unique firmware-based terminals have been found to be compromised as well. Can you explain how the Tripwire software can scan devices with proprietary firmware installed, uh, for example, a kiosk? And We'll go ahead and hand this over to Catherine to address. Yeah, um, this is a good question, and I'll just highlight that uh, you know if you're not using a standard or typical OS, and you can t be, you can get in touch with the manufacturer of that device and find out if they have any tools or have also if they have been found to be compromised, because a lot of third parties. Um, Providers of these ter terminals have have sh been shown to be compromised, so that's one thing. the 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 point of or the direct question about can Tripwire software uh, scan devices with proprietary firmware installed? Um, we can go on a case by case basis. We don't typically handle non standard. Um, products that are out there. However, uh, on occasion when something has come up and we can work on that, it's a sort of a custom. Uh, professional services sort of engagement. And so all I can say is, you know, on the price list, if you were looking for a particular OS, you might not see it. Uh, it doesn't mean we couldn't do it. So that's it. That's really all there is to say about that. I would like to also add and highlight uh, for those of you that um, might have concerns that when you take a look at the US CERT, it does offer exactly who to call and when and what to do if you have needs or suspect that you might have issues. Um, in addition, we here at Tripwire uh, would, would as well take your calls. Our professional services team could, w could assist in some forensic uh, investigations, but um, in any case, let me turn it over to uh, Ed. Yeah, and just a, a, a follow-on to the, the question about uh, be, being able to, de to detect non-standard op operating systems, just a couple points on that note is that um, you know, a lot of times even with an embedded or proprietary system, oftentimes it's, you know, just a Linux operating system or a Windows embedded operating system. Um, and for in, in those cases, um, you know, it, it, we're still able to detect the device and give you a little bit more information about what it is. And um, in fact, our, our vulnerabilities and exposures research team, uh, they not only research vulnerabilities, uh, they also write detection rules for operating systems. 
Uh, I want to say we have detection support for over 2,000 or so operating systems at this point. Um, the, the team is, is adding rules on, on, an, on an ongoing basis, and, and they do take feature requests. So if, if there's a, an operating system that's important, uh, maybe a lesser known application or even a vulnerability, um, that is something you can request from our research team, um, or potentially some, something that you can write a detection rule yourself. There's, there are ways of, of implementing that uh, in addition to the pro services op offering that, uh, option, I should say, that, that Catherine mentioned. So we're approaching the, the top of the hour. I, I think we have uh, time for just one last question from the list here. Um, so we'll pull the question. Let me find the list here one moment. Sorry about that. It, go ahead, Catherine. I had a problem with my mute button. Well, the technically non-savvy uh, will um, fall behind. Sorry. <laughs> How long has it taken uh, our, our systems to identify that an infection has occurred, assuming that the infection was in place prior to your software? Well, I'll just say that uh, let's say let's say you have you already have some. Uh, uh, reasons to believe that you might be, you should be concerned. If you go about installing the agent and immediately it will go out and map your system, it will immediately look for, uh, with the new content that we've got developed, it will immediately begin to look for things that are known and it can indicate um, as soon as the scan is finished on your system, any individual system. If it's a widespread, you know, it's, it's here, there, and everywhere, that will take longer, of course. Um, and obviously the vulnerability um, uh, tool can also help a bit. So I just would say that for the exact specific files and hashes and registry changes and other details that we've already prepared for and have, it, it can be very quick, very fast. I wouldn't be able to give you like, oh, uh, 27 seconds, no. But you know, it's, it's not gonna take four days. So you would be able to tell within a fairly short order once it's mapped your system. And that's it. I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you. Yeah, we'll go ahead and close up the Q&A session and hand the mic back over to Kate to close us out. Thanks, Edward. And thank you all for listening in today to our presentation. We hope you found it uh, informative and interesting. Thanks to our presenters, Ken Weston, Edward Smith, and Catherine Brocklehurst. As I had mentioned earlier, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand webcast and the slides, and we also hope you will join us for future web webcasts. On that note, on September 25th, we will have a fascinating webcast, Hacking Back Proactive Threat Intelligence with Honeypots for Active Defense. So you can go to tripwire.com to check that out and all of our other information. Thank you all for joining us today, and have a great day.